Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again. And should be saying welcome back because uh, this is the finale of the Hundred Years War. So if you're if you're new to my channel and you come across this video, this is the end of a series. I would definitely of the Hundred Years Wars. I, I would definitely uh, recommend uh, starting from the beginning of the series because uh, this is the finale, and it would kind of suck to you know, you know start to watch this. And then, you know, because then you miss out on a bunch of cool videos and you'll know what the outcome, right? I mean, I guess a lot of people probably already know the outcome. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Hundred Years War, last time it was like a, like a month and a half or something like that since we've done uh, uh, the last one, the Hundred Years War, which I actually like, I went back to my, the video before this and watched like, you know, 30 seconds of it to kind of, rehash my brain you know what a little bit of what went down and i read the description down here and so basically uh you know france pretty much whooped england's butt pretty much and they pretty much have all their land back in france except for gastony and I, i'm guessing this is the last battle where they finally take the last the last portion of uh i guess their land back from france or they take england's land uh, however you want to look at it uh or maybe I'm trying to think maybe i think maybe england holds on to it for a little while longer than maybe just hands it back over down the line so and that's why that's why i say uh you know makes you think that, okay this is the finale you know england's gonna lose this final battle but just there's a part of me that thinks you know that england wins this and they hold on to it for a while but later on they ended up i don't know maybe losing it. i don't know uh, I just know, like, throughout this war, uh, England pretty much was kicking butt for the first half of this series. And then, you know, uh, once to come, kind of like when she, like, once, like, Joan of Arc kind of came on the scene, uh, it, it's, it's been basically all France, if I remember correctly. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button below. I really appreciate it. This episode just got released today. Uh, and, yeah, you, you guys are definitely in the comments saying... Uh, you know the new episodes out, so I really appreciate it, guys. And so maybe I'll be the first one that actually uh, gets to watch this video, right? So uh, yeah, we're gonna. That's why it only has like eighty four thousand views right now. This because uh, it literally, literally just got released today. I mean, you guys aren't gonna see this video till tomorrow, but anyways, uh, let's jump into this, guys. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. Dude, dude I'm excited because like. And when, when, when a new video gets released on a series I'm doing, it just makes it more fun. Yeah, we're a whole bunch of history nerds here, aren't we? <laughs> this stuff's just great, right? Dun, dun, dun. All right, guys. Yeah, like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. If you haven't yet, I'd really appreciate it. Do -do, bam. In our previous episode on the Hundred Years' War, we covered the Battle of Formigny in 1451 and the subsequent fall of English-controlled Normandy to Charles VII. That campaign showed just how capable France's professional military had become. The use of modern artillery and superior organisation led to a great victory over a numerically superior English force, a far cry from the days of Crécy and Agincourt. There were only two areas... Yeah, the last battle... Man, like, English got, like, slaughtered. They just got surrounded, and basically everyone got wiped out. There was no, basically, survivors. Uh, they were... Wiped them out. And I said there was no... No one was kept alive because on a, pre on a previous battle, English kind of slaughtered all the survivors as well. So, you know, you definitely... These two countries don't exactly like each other very much here, you know? And they're both... Both sides were pissed off because the other side's you know, killing people who are surrendering and, uh, you know, probably rape and pillaging in each other's lands, you know, and I'm sure they all have families and stuff. So, yeah, no love lost between these two countries for sure. A far cry from the days of Crécy and Agincourt. There were only two areas of France now under Lancastrian control, Calais and Gascony, but the latter, in Plantagenet control for 300 years, was firmly in the French king's sights. So let us finally conclude the Hundred Years' War, tie a bow around the medieval age, 
and finish our series with the Battle of Castillon in 1453. Before we if I, and, oh, I guess we're about to do a commercial here, but uh, and for all the pros, you know, if if you're also new to this, if you've done this series but you haven't seen the War of the Roses, I believe that's to continue. I've done that series. I believe that is the continuation after this series. I would definitely check it out. Really good series. So yeah, don't just disappear after this series. Go check out some other kind of content because you know we do a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, anyways, I think he's doing a little advertisement here. I'm trying to jump ahead, maybe. The sponsors of today's video and one of our most loyal partners, Maj there are more than 3,000 to offer for our viewers. Click the link in the description to get hundreds of history documentaries anytime, anywhere. The Duke of Somerset's complete loss of northern France in such a blitzkrieg-like manner sent yet another political shockwave throughout England and pushed the kingdom closer to civil war. The Duke was briefly imprisoned in the tower, and this internal strife only distracted the government from dealing with new problems on the continent. France was able to turn its efforts fully south towards Gascony with the victory. Back in 1449, local forces subordinate to Charles had already captured Cognac, Saint-Magras and Moulion. Meanwhile, the Count of Foix, a powerful magnate in the south of France, allied with the ascendant king in the same year and put his considerable military force to good use, capturing Guiche and 15 other castles. Despite this preliminary success, Gascony in its entirety would probably be far more difficult to capture and hold than Normandy. It had been a fief of the kings of England for over three centuries, compared to Normandy's 30 years, and most of the area's nobility and population still remained loyal to their longtime rulers. Yeah, it, it definitely makes sense to be harder because 300 years, pretty much everyone who lives there now is all accustomed to, you know, you know England, English rule. So they're basically that all the base are all English people who live there now. And like they say, you're in Normandy for 30 years. A lot of those people remember what it was like when France took over Normandy, you know, and they probably have a lot of built up hatred for them because of it so that a lot of them already re remember you know a lot of them are already still french you know and so it, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense why gas can be you know, a lot harder not just going against like you know english troops you're going against the people as well so which would have been probably the opposite in normandy but there were many reasons for this but trade was a primary factor between 1445 and 1449 for example Wine exports to England reached never-before-seen heights. Gascon merchants and lords were making vast profits from their overlords and weren't keen to see the status quo change. Only two months after the fall of Cherbourg in October 1450, French forces opened the attack on Gascony by putting Jonzac under siege. The castle fell in short order, and the army marched south clashing with a small Anglo-Gascon force outside Bordeaux and crushing it before withdrawing to Angoulême for the winter. You know, this music is just so nonchalant right now. Like, you know, the people are dying here in these little battles. The music is just like chilling. I'm sorry, like, it just makes me smile and laugh. It just, it, it seems just so chill, like nonchalant that these little battles are going on. Eh, who cares? Force outside Bordeaux and crushing it before withdrawing to Angoulême for the winter. Campaigning began again in spring 1451, and the French army quickly captured Montguillon after a short siege. From that point, just like in the fall of Normandy, Whoa. Gascon castles fell very quickly. Blé was captured on May 24, followed by Bourg, saint emilion and Castillon in the five days after that. The speed of the conquest was made possible by strong French artillery, in addition to well-executed diplomacy and bribery, which undermined... And I guess it'd be more expensive, but you think of like castles, like I guess a lot of castles do do this, but I'm sure it's just, like I said, it's more expensive. Like, you, you know that you know, when people are going to siege you or whatever, they're going to blow down your walls. So why don't I just like, have to, like two sets of walls or, you know, basically you're sacrificing the outer one, but, you know, the, the inner walls basically, you know, nothing can hardly happen to it unless someone actually take, comes with it with a siege, you know, towers and ladders or something like that. I don't know. 
But the visuals right here, whatever game this is, is really cool. In addition to well-executed diplomacy and bribery, which undermined baronial resistance. A decisive instance of the latter occurred on June 23rd, when the central city of Bordeaux surrendered without a fight, as its mayor received a generous pension from the French king as a reward. Just over a month later, Bayard too was captured, and the feuding English could do nothing but watch in horror as their last continental possession, save for Calais, slipped away. Unfortunately for the French, they hadn't learned from the Black Prince's mistake after the Treaty of... I was say like, wow, like, that's it? <clears throat> I thought that was going to be the end of the video where the French took it over and bam, and, you know, English goes home, but they already took it over. But apparently there's a but where they didn't learn from something, which I ended up pausing. So, uh -oh, something's about to come back and haunt them. Fortunately for the French, they hadn't learned from the Black Prince's mistake after the Treaty of Bretigny and started levying heavy taxation on the newly acquired Gascon territory in order to pay for its defence. Not surprisingly, this, along with the rapaciousness of French soldiers, meant that resentment immediately began to build. At the same time, the Kingdom of England was not prepared to let Gascony go without a fight. But yeah, it's one of those things that you just took over, you won, like, you know, everything's still, you know, not 100% down there. You kind of keep those people happy for a little while, you know, but, you know, they're just like, okay, move on, move on with business. And yeah, piss the people off by raising their taxes. And yeah, England's like, we're not going down quite yet, you know, like. The Kingdom of England was not prepared to let Gascony go without a fight. But military preparations were slow, impeded by a deteriorating political situation that seemed to reach its climax in early 1452. Richard of York owned vast estates on the Welsh borders, and it was there, while he was in Ireland, that the tenants rose up in revolt against Henry VI in February. The rebels persuaded their lord to return from his quasi-exile and put an end to the Queen's regime. An army quickly gathered around York when he crossed back into England, and he began moving towards London. The Lancastrians mustered a force of their own and faced off against York at Dartford. Rather than attacking, the Duke of York presented Henry with a list of grievances and demands, which included the arrest of Edmund Beaufort, the Duke of Somerset, and York's bitter rival, who was accused of badly mismanaging the defence of France in previous years. The weak monarch initially agreed to the demands, but the power behind his throne, Margaret of Anjou, intervened and eventually forced York to back down and reaffirm his loyalty to the crown. Somerset was left in charge of the government. While this was going on, indentures had managed to raise an army of some 3,000 troops under the command of a 65-year-old John Talbot, the Earl of Shrewsbury. Setting the stage for his attack was the situation in Gascony. Unrest had turned to subterfuge and envoys reached London in 1452, inviting the English back and offering to provide assistance if they returned. Alrighty then. Yeah, def de you know, definitely when you have the Civil War kind of going on in England doesn't really help, you know, when you got to go conquer, uh, you know, uh, France, because you can't send all your troops, right? Because in case, you know, the inner squabbles, you know, in case you got to defend yourself against your enemies at home, you know, so they're definitely distracted. But, you know, the king of England not going down, he he, he, he wants Gaffney bad, you know, and if he has the people on his side over there, you know, he might be thinking, oh, this could be a quick victory and, you know, just might make, might, might make him look good to the locals and stuff, you know? After English ships swept their French counterparts off the seas, Talbot audaciously sailed the long distance to Gascony and disembarked on the Medoc Peninsula on October 17th. Less than a week later, the pre-planned anti-French uprising in Bordeaux led to the city's capitulation. Most other castles in western Gascony fell by the end of the year, save a few holdouts. Wow. 
It was obvious that Talbot's bold attack had taken Charles VII totally by surprise, as his forces had been shifted to Normandy in order to counter a possible invasion there. The English received 4,000 additional troops and supplies from home during the winter, while Charles, enraged at the Gascon treachery, hurried to send advanced forces south to reinforce those castles still under French control, while he prepared to lead an invasion of the recalcitrant province in person. In early June 1453, four separate smaller armies began to muster at different points along the frontier with Gascony preparing to invade on multiple fronts. Two southern armies assembled at Languedoc under the Count de Clermont and Gaston IV, Count of Foix, who prepared his forces nearby at Bienne. In, In the, the north, north, a third army, commanded by Marshals de Jalons and Lohiac, readied to march from around Angoulême. Charles VII headed a strategic reserve army stationed in the Lusignan region. The king made sure that all of the contingents were well supplied with siege engines and gunpowder artillery, particularly the northern one at Angoulême, which was accompanied by Charles's artillery master, Jean Bureau. Wow. The combined French advance began almost simultaneously in early June. In the south, Foix and Clermont marched in close cooperation from the start, moving north towards Bordeaux until the latter received a message from Talbot offering battle. Being close enough to help, Foix reinforced his comrade to face the challenge together, but this made the English commander withdraw to Bordeaux. The two for I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of curious how uh, well all these guys kind of get along right now, because obviously we've seen in past wars and episodes where, you know, cause right now I think it's just Talbot, you know, kind of in charge of the of you know the english kind of army right now and but they over here you got four different leaders and so somebody wants to get the fame and fortune to finally kick england out you know and so i wonder if there'll be some squabbling here that will affect the outcome of this i'm just keeping it in mind but this made the english commander withdraw to bordeaux the two forces subsequently split up and remained near the city in order to deal with any English sally. The northern army, meanwhile, began a methodical thrust through the Dordogne Valley, approaching the city of Castillon from the east in mid-July 1453. When Charles heard of the army's progress at his base at saint jean d'Angely, the king ordered it to besiege the city, which was at the time held by about 50 men-at-arms and 350 archers. In contrast, the assaulting army was a relatively standard one, about 8,000 men strong, but with an especially formidable siege train. Castillon itself was a strongly fortified town, with the fast-flowing Dordogne River in the south, running east to west, and extensive forests to the north. In a clearing on the edge of this woodland, surrounded on three sides by trees, was the Priory of saint Florent, located on elevated ground. Rather than encircling and cutting off Castillon with fortifications, as in a traditionally conducted siege, Jean Bureau, who was put in overall command of conducting the operation, didn't want to be trapped in a pincer between Talbot and the garrison if English forces moved to relieve the city. Hmm. Instead, he sent a thousand crossbowmen to hold the priory, while he supervised the army's 700 engineers in constructing a fortified artillery park on the plain of Col, made up of 300 guns, both heavy and light, operated by 700 gunners. To protect the weapons, defensive ditches were dug on three sides, backed by raised earthen ramparts topped with formidable timber defences. To screen the open northern flank of his enclosure, Bureau sent a thousand Bretons to hold the village of Capitolon. In Bordeaux, Talbot received an urgent letter from the English garrison in Castillon, which led to immense pressure from the Gascon city leaders to go out and relieve it. Possibly before he was ready, Talbot marched out with 6,000 English infantry, 2,000. Yeah, I was kind of confused there for a second. I was like, but I thought like Talbot was in the the castle that you know that they're gonna have to hold on that you know the french were gonna besiege but no he has to leave to go to castany which i didn't realize was a different place 
I should be like, duh. But yeah, and so he's going to get there, relieve them, or help them out without running into the French as well. So this is definitely heating up and getting very interesting. 1,000 Gascons and 1,000 mounted archers and men-at-arms. Okay, so they're almost basically matching up with the French right now. Okay. To do just that, after bypassing a few of their own towns, and marching through quiet, forested paths in the hills of Orable to maintain surprise, the aging Talbot's Anglo-Gascon vanguard of 1,300 mounted troops assembled near the Priory at dawn on July 17, 1453. When formed up, they burst out from the forest and attacked the Priory from an unexpected direction, killing 120 of the French missile troops and capturing it after a brief but fierce fight. The remainder were harried in their retreat by the English cavalry until some of their own horse came in support. With that, Talbot's forces were pushed back, but managed to get valuable information about Bureau's artillery enclosure, which was reported to the commander, whose main force had just reached the Priory. It's morale high from the- There we go, wow. So they were able to sneak up on them. Those are a bunch of archers. So I guess, you know, you're, you're right there with cavalry. It's not much of a match. So the fact that they're, you know, element of surprise, you know, basically, okay, basically right now it's like round one to the English. Yeah, I wonder how, like, for the, for, you know, the French are going to kind of counteract this. The Vanguard's initial easy victory. Talbot initially decided not to follow up his attack immediately believing that his troops needed to rest after the long march and initial skirmish. However, at the artillery park, Bureau was preparing for a fight by dismounting all of his horsemen and sending the horses away with their grooms. The movement of such a vast amount of horses kicked up a cloud of dust, which was spotted by the English scouts and misinterpreted as a French retreat. When they reported back to Talbot that the enemy army was getting away, the commander reversed his judgment and decided to resume the assault uh -oh. against the advice of a capable subordinate, Sir Thomas Everingham. It is said that the Earl swore to his personal chaplain that he would not hear the Christian mass until he had defeated the French army. With promises of loot at the enemy camp given, Talbot led his arrayed army along the northern bank of the Dordogne towards Bureau's fortification speeding ahead with his mounted advanced units, while the main body of infantry followed up in the rear. Their approach was spotted by French outriders, who reported the incoming force to Bureau, while they were also followed by some supply ships in the river. As the English vanguard turned 90 degrees left to face the artillery park, Bureau was in the process of concentrating his 300 small cannons, mainly culverins and rebuldikins, on the southern rampart, facing Talbot's vanguard. The latter ordered his troops to dismount and fight on foot, but the completely unarmored English commander, who was unprotected because of his oath to never bear arms against Charles VII ever again, remained in the saddle. Wow. You get chilling, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess he's gonna chill and just lead the army and just point fingers at where to go and whatnot. And he's just, he doesn't need a sword or uh, right knowing he had no rifles back then. But uh, yeah, I mean he he's the leader back there anyway. He shouldn't really be on the front line, so he should be all right. Once again, Everingham advised caution against attacking such a well prepared position. Instead, suggesting that it be starved out. Talbot yeah. refused and overruled him fearing that any hesitation might harm his reputation. Oh Seeing that Bureau hadn't yet finished moving all the cannons, Talbot ordered Everingham to lead the first charge. With a cry of St. George, he led the first- That is like the most aggravating thing when it comes to these videos, when people just care about their reputation instead of what's best for their country or their men or the strategy they want. You know, they don't care about the outcome as long as they look good. You know, I don't know. Like, that know you guys when you watch these with me or when you watch these on your own. Does that, like, aggravate you? Like, it doesn't matter what side you're on. It just aggravates me in general that people disregard their own troops that way.
speed the first charge. With a cry of St. George, he led the first attack, advancing across the field and assaulting the ramparts. At such close range, the French light artillery inflicted heavy casualties on Evelyn's yeah. men, supposedly killing six men with a single shot. The leader himself managed to get to the top of the wall, but was shot and killed by one of the French culverins. Duh. Despite the losses, fighting on the artillery park's southern edge went on. The main body of several thousand Anglo-Gascon infantry was now coming up, whose commander, Lord Kendall, was ordered against the enclosure's right flank. Because the troops were coming in unit by unit, the attack commenced piecemeal, with contingents being fed into the fight as they arrived. Now reinforced by the infantry, Talbot's vanguard troops received a morale boost and attacked with renewed ferocity, inflicting casualties of their own, but suffering badly from the French culverin fire. Though Talbot's numbers were larger than Bureau's, the latter's strong fortification stalled the English attacks. After an hour of grinding and inconclusive combat on the ramparts, however, French forces were thinning and those who remained tiring. But at that moment, the 1,000 Bretons marched onto the battlefield from the northern hills, having received a message from Bureau earlier in the day. While their footmen streamed into the fortified artillery park and reinforced the go. beleaguered defenders, the Breton cavalry swept around the eastern trenches and crashed into Talbot's exposed right wing. Wreathed in smoke and noise given off by the French gunpowder weapons, the English were taken totally by surprise. The aged Earl turned to meet the assault, but was wounded in the arm by a projectile. That wasn't the end of it. Seeing the English struck in the flank, French forces inside the fortification launched a counterattack from the front, some of them even remounting to do so. What happened next is unclear and varies in the sources, but it seems like Talbot's lines began to break, routing towards the Dordogne. While this happened, the commander himself rallied a small contingent alongside his son and acted as a rearguard so his army could get away. However, a cannon shot the Earl's horse out from under him and trapped its rider under it. Damn. A family legend claims that while trapped, Talbot urged his son to flee, stating, Leave me, the day belongs to the enemy. There is no disgrace in flight. This is your first battle. In what was perhaps the last gasp of chivalry the medieval age had to offer, Yeah, that was the one who wanted to fight, but now saying run away, is that correct? Talbot, Talbot was the one who wanted to, like, let's go, let's fight. And then, you know, yeah, now he's saying, huh, telling his son, oh, go away. There, there's no shame in running away. Kind of like hypocritical, huh? The son refused and was killed alongside his father, who died from an axe to the skull. When, when the English commander's gone. banner fell, the army lost heart and totally collapsed. Some soldiers drowned attempting to cross the Dordogne at Rosan Ford. Others were run down by the victorious Breton run. horsemen, while about a thousand found refuge in Castillon itself. The Anglo-Gascon casualties... Wow, so they didn't, like, just slaughter them? That's why, obviously, they were running off, like, they didn't afraid to be slaughtered, but they actually took them prisoner? Uh, definitely a surprise there. So, uh, definitely a very stupid decision. I mean, you're, why would you go attack? A fortified area. Uh, oh yeah, they had, they had false information, and the guy like was worried about his reputation. I forgot about that. So the two big no nos right there. Thousand found refuge in Castillon itself. The Anglo-Gascon casualties are uncertain, ranging from a low of five hundred to a high of four thousand, while French losses were quite light in comparison. Yeah. When John Bureau found Talbot's corpse on the field, he had the old soldier given a burial with full honours. Similarly, when his banner and collar of office were given to Charles VII, the king remarked, God have mercy on a good knight. Talbot had never broken his oath. Huh. Castillon was taken on July 20th, and the French king even rode with his army to quell a small internal squabble. That strife was nothing compared to Gascony's, 
which, despite stubborn resistance, was falling one castle at a time. Bordeaux was put under siege, and ten weeks later, after being strangled and battered from both land and sea, finally fell to Charles VII. On October 19, 1453, French banners were raised above the city, and the English in Gascony were forced to leave. No treaty was immediately signed, and few people at the time would have known it, but the Hundred Years' War had come to an end at Castillon and Bordeaux. After more than a century of struggle, France's Valois kings had emerged victorious against often immensely unfavourable odds and in the face of some appalling defeats. The impact of the victory was profound, with some historians even suggesting that the monarchy's hard-won prestige set the French kingdom on its road to absolute monarchy. In England, the final defeat was to prove catastrophic. In late 1453, King Henry VI fell to catatonic schizophrenia and became unable to rule. Two years later, his weakness as a king played a part in the outbreak of the Wars of the Roses. You can watch our video on the Wars of the Roses via the link in the description or by clicking the card in the top right corner. Wow. More videos on the histories of France and England are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Wow. Well, there you have it. End of the Hundred Years' War. Wow. I don't know. I thought, like, for some reason, that last battle was going to be drawn out, and there's going to be, there's going to be like, a lot more to it. But there really, there wasn't, you know, a lot to it. I mean, basically, the English tried, you know, tried to force themselves on the French, and the French, you know, they just had their cover, their fort was just too great. They just couldn't get a foothold inside there. And then, you know, the French backup arrived, and that pretty much was all she wrote. Uh, but, wow. So, yeah, France is the winner of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, congratulations, France. Uh, I'm just kind of, and then we, then we got on the War of the Rose, which is what I've already done, which I've done before this. So, uh, you have to excuse my... I guess, confusion, I guess I have in that series just because I did that before this one. Sorry. That, that series was already uh, already done before this was done. That's why I did that one. But anyways, uh, you're definitely really cool. I'm kind of curious. Uh, for French and English in school, I'm sure, like those of you who are from France and England watching this, I'm sure this was one of those wars that everyone probably knew from each country one of those big wars that everyone was kind of learned kind of, kind of taught right and so i know like if you're an english person watching like you're excited about the first part of this war like yeah we're kicking butt and then you, afterwards you probably some of you were probably like i don't feel like watching the end because i know how it ends <laughs> and then the, the you know the french people watching this are probably like i don't really want to watch the beginning because i know how it starts and then uh, Probably more were more into obviously when they when uh, Joan of Arc came in and started like you know that's when everything kind of switched, but definitely a really cool war. Now I know what the Hundred Years' War is, but I I was I was pretty sure you know that it was between France and England, but like obviously, you know, Hundred Years' War basically is like a whole bunch of wars all in what they took place within a hundred years. Obviously, you know it wasn't just. A continuous battle really i mean it, it, there was a lot of years between battles because you know it's just you i can't you know that just it's like probably impossible just to have continuous battle for 100 years i mean come on but anyways guys i hope you enjoyed this series uh please hit that like and subscribe button i'd really appreciate it and hope you guys continue on with more series that i do and yeah catch you guys in future videos always a blast uh kings and journals amazing channel and catch you guys in future videos appreciate it, guys you guys have a good night